I want you to know that um, I'm excited about kids. Now, these two guys came down to my house yesterday. How many fish did you all catch? Eleven. I mean, I caught ten. You caught ten? How many did you catch? Eleven. Eleven? That's a lot. Daddy caught some. I caught some. We caught a lot of fish, right? I caught a 
And that is, huh? Yeah, he also caught a snapping turtle. <laughs> that was exciting, trying to get the hook out. Anyway, it was a very, very fun time. But I want you to know that Jesus has called us to be fishers of men, of people. Not just men, just not, you know, boys and girls, men and women, okay? What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean we're supposed to take a fishing pole with a hook and go start hooking people and making them bleed? No, what does that mean? Don't tell other people the word. All right, did you all hear that? Yeah. Yeah, go tell other people the word. The main word being Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Give your life to him. That's the main thing. Make followers of Jesus, you know, and that is the most important thing ever. And I know regular fishing can be fun, especially when they're biting. It kind of be boring when they don't bite. And we have done plenty of that. But when they start biting, man, that's exciting. So it's up to us to take that same excitement, but make it that, that there's, it's more important to tell people about Jesus Christ. Would you promise to do that? Tell your friends at school and your neighbors and other family members that Jesus loves them and he wants them as their disciples. And that way, Jesus said, it's kind of like catching fish, okay? And only it's better, better than a regular fish because we're catching people for eternity to love Jesus, okay? All right, let's all stand up. Let's all stand up, stand tall. And stand quiet. How's that sound? Okay. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I ask your blessing upon all these children. And I pray, Father, for your gifts to come forth and all of them. In the name of Jesus, I bless them as you did many years ago. But I call forth the, the, the giftings and the callings of pastors, preachers, teachers, uh, missionaries, uh, Christian moms and dads, and, and uh, uh, Christian presidents, and, and Christian congressmen, congresswomen. Father, and I call forth all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Father, that are in each and every one of these, even residing now. If you live in them, Father, then your gifts live in them. And I call forth every single gift that they won't hold anything back and just bless them. Fill them with the Holy Spirit from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, thank you. You can go downstairs. now. Matthew chapter 6. And we're also going to be in... Uh, John and Romans 2, we we'll start out in Matthew, Matthew 6, actually 1 John, chapter 4. Who's your daddy? And I know that, you know, if you've, depending on your church background, that might sound a little bit uh, frivolous, might sound uh, maybe even disrespectful, depending on your, your, your background and the churches you were raised in, or the church you were raised in. To refer to God as daddy, but I want you to know the Bible refers to God as daddy. Okay? That's one aspect of God. We're not, we're not being disrespectful. We're being scriptural here, and you'll, you'll see in a, in, a, in a few minutes. But, you know, we, we talk about the majesty and the power and, and the respect for God that we are to have, and, and that we, the, God is an all powerful God. And God does have a wrathful side to him, uh, a wrath against um, the powers of darkness against sin, because uh, he's he's he has he's a holy God and, and that has to be a part of his nature. But uh, there's another side of God that sometimes we don't think about too much because we hear about the other so much, and that's the daddy side of God. Okay, and and uh, we're going to look at some aspects of what that means and uh, and who's your daddy. Now I know that's a phrase that's been around a while and can mean several different things. Um, but uh, um, I, I just, uh, we just got to know, remember when you were a kid and you were around some other little kids, you know, and, and uh, I, maybe this happened more around guys, boys, okay? You know, we got, we're on the playground, right? You know, you're little and, and uh, you know, you're trying to be all that in a bag of chips, you know, be powerful and, you know, and, and a lot more than we are, <laughs> you know, and, and say, uh, you know, and usually, a lot of times the phrase will come up, my daddy can beat up your daddy. You know, I might not be able to beat you up, but my daddy can, you know. And uh, it's kind of it's that kind of mentality, only not in a braggadocious way, but in a confident way. Confidence that the, the, the God that we serve, that our heavenly father, who is our daddy God, 
has all power and all authority in this universe, and nobody is more powerful than him. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God that actually lives in us if we've got Jesus in our heart and in our life, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of power that, that, that the potential that we have inside of us. And so let's take a look at this. Now, uh, really, the focus is not only upon Daddy God, but upon our Heavenly Father. The word Father is, is a very important uh, uh, title for God and a description of God. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 Let's go back to verse 8, actually. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May God add his blessing in the reading of these two verses in Jesus' name. Now, you know that the, the, the Lord's Prayer is, is what Jesus is teaching on here. But uh, let's, let, let's, let's just look at it this way. We all have a concept of God. I think everybody has a concept of God. Um, our ideas has developed over time from many different sources, including society, uh, the media, uh, scripture, hopefully, and from our own earthly father and other fathers that we have known on this, on this earth. Now, the problem is, too often we get our understanding of God from so many sources, we wind up being confused at best and outright fearful at most. You know, because we, you, you start hearing conflicting ideas of who God is, you know, and, and uh, this is especially true when we use humans as our sole example of what Father is all about, as is so often the case of understanding God. And, 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 and so we, we hear the word father, we, we put everybody into that same category, and, and, um, and, and then that gets pretty um, uh, dangerous, though, when, when we equate our heavenly father with earthly fathers who are imperfect. Although we have good fathers, we have good fathers. I had a good father. I have a good father. And uh, uh, earthly father I'm talking about. And a lot of us in here do. And then the, there's the other side of that coin where a lot of fathers are, are either were abusive or absent altogether and those kind of things. And that's a reality we have to deal with. And so this is the challenge when the Bible talks about father or heavenly father referring to God, then, then there's some challenges, inherent challenges there we have to deal with. So uh, with that said, there is no other description of God that describes so clearly his relationship to us. I believe that that is that title, that description is in the Bible for a reason, uh, uh, and 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 so we need to we need to study it. So, but what if we have not had a good earthly father, and 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 and, and uh, as an example, you know, which which is increasingly the case today, as we already already stated. So, we have to let's see what what the biblical definition of father really is. I, I remember a story. Um, way back um, years ago, we, we attended Life Church up in St. Louis, and Rick Shelton is the, is the pastor, or was the pastor up there. I don't know if he still is or not. Anyway, he was Joyce Meyer's pastor, actually, for many years. And uh, he was telling the story once when we were visiting up there, and he's telling the story about his, uh, uh, his wife was out of town, so um, his son was, was, uh, wanted to sleep with him, so they were in bed in the middle of the night. The son wakes up and says, Daddy, don't do it. Daddy, don't do it. Daddy, don't do it. And the coach woke him out of a sound sleep. He said, son, son, son. And the son was just so deep into this dream or this nightmare. And he kept yelling, Daddy, don't do it. He finally got over his son and shook him up and said, son, I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, so many times we have the wrong concept of God because we have the wrong concept of Father. And so let's see what the scripture says, as we shall see God is the absolute perfect Father in every way. Now, when we allow God, our Heavenly Father, to establish His love relationship with us, at least two major things happen. The first thing is all fear is wiped away. All fear is wiped away. Now, I know um, there's a certain aspect of God that says, fear God, 
Okay? Now, that fear of God does not mean to be afraid of God. That means to respect God for who he is. Give him his rightful due. Let, he is the God of the universe, after all. He has all power and all authority. And let me tell you, someone has all that power and all that authority, we better respect. We better understand what that means. We need to revere God. Uh, treat him with reverence. Okay? He has a very... It's important that we revere God. But, with that said, that still doesn't mean we're to walk around scared to death that, 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 that of God, you know, for whatever reason may come to your mind. It is our knowledge of our sinful nature, our sinful condition, that usually prevents us from, from really realizing the real loving nature of our Heavenly Father. You know? We may not know much theology, but we know, okay, I've done some bad things, and God's a good God, and no stew, no mix, and so he must be mad at me. You know, that's kind of the, that's the basic theology, the basic understanding we have from a little kid, okay? Because, you know, we do something wrong at home, you know, mommy or daddy punishes us, so why wouldn't God do the same thing? And, and there's a certain aspect of that, well, God does discipline us. That's a different thing, okay? But here it is. When we see ourselves in light of his perfect holiness, we begin to fear his wrath. This, this, this awful, what this does is begin to breed a self-image, and, and it, it breeds a, a fearful self-image of us, and it begins escalating as our heart and mind becomes dominated by how inadequate and unworthy we are of being near him, and we realize how much we fall short of God's requirements. The Bible's clear. We do fall short of God's requirements because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? Uh, there, you can't do enough good to, to, to merit heaven. You and I, we can't. It's impossible. And, 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 and so, so, so we, we get dominated by that. We begin to, even if we can't put it into words, we get that feeling. We got that knowing inside. And, and so when not dealt with, when that feeling or that self-image is not dealt with in light of God's grace, we become paralyzed, discouraged, and full of dread. I don't know about you, but I hate dread. I hate, you know, dread is just like a big... Uh, weight around my, my, my legs and my, my heart and a dark cloud over me all the time, you know, and just like, shh, no matter what I do, it's going to be wrong, you know, all those kinds of fears and all those kinds of things. And it's just, a, it's depressing. Let's just say what it is. It's depressing. And, and some people walk around all the time feeling that more than we may want, more than we know, walk around with that dread. That what am I going to do today? It's going to disappoint God. You know? Because we, we know that, 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 that we're not going to stack up. And, and so or we feel that. So we are deceived. We are deceived into thinking that we are living under an angry God who is waiting to strike us down or at least make life miserable for us when we mess up. Like he's watching us and he's got that lightning bolt. And go ahead. Go ahead and do that. Bam! <laughs> And we feel it, don't we? It's usually our own attack on our own self that we feel. See, God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to save the world. He loves us. God is for us. He is not against us. He is for us. The question remains, are you for God? Are you for God? Have you made a choice? Are you for God? God's already made up his mind. He created us, loved us in the very beginning, provided a way for us to get in right relationship with him in spite of our sin through Jesus Christ, and so he's waiting on us. Forget about waiting on God. He, he's, you know, he's waiting on us now. What decision are we going to make? When we are willing to draw close to God and, and, and allow him to get close to us, then we realize that he is far from a hateful, abusive father. He is far from it. He loves us with an everlasting love, the Bible says. His mercies are new every morning. His grace is sufficient for us. What more can he say? What more can he do? He's done it all and continues to do it all. But yet we're hesitant 
Because we haven't drawn close to God. The closer we get to God, the more we recognize his nature. The more we understand, whoa, this isn't what I thought it was. This is good, you know? He's not the taskmaster, the slave driver. He's my father. He's my father. He's my father. We must finally realize that although God cannot allow sin, that is true, that is biblical, he has provided a way to overcome it through repentance, faith in his son Jesus, and a big dose of grace. That's what it means to get in right relationship with God. Through God's perfect love, our fear dissipates like an early morning fog. Now, did you know God has a bad memory? No, God remembers everything. No, he doesn't. When we ask forgiveness for our sins, he forgets those sins. He, as far as the east is from the west, you've heard this. It was, this isn't scriptural, but it's got scriptural principle. You know, he throws it in a sea of forgetfulness, you know, our sins and everything. He, 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 he has a great memory for the good stuff, but when we ask forgiveness... He forgets those, forgets those sins. I like the story about the, uh, I heard about an Indian that, that had a great memory. He was well known for having a great memory. And one, one man was very skeptical. He'd heard stories about this Indian who was almost had an impeccable memory. And so he walked up to this Indian one time and he says, I'm going to test this guy. He thought to himself, I'm going to test, see how, how good his memory is. He says, what did you have to eat on September 10th, 1943? And the Indian answered, eggs. Well, the man was not impressed. <laughs> he said, he's trying to make a fool of me. Everybody has eggs for breakfast. So, yeah, he said, he's a phony. So he walked away and didn't even think any more about it. Well, uh, roughly 13 years later, he ran into the same Indian at a, at, a, at a bus stop. And he walked up, and he recognized him, walked up to him. And he thought, oh, I'm going to greet my, my uh, acquaintance there from years ago. And he went over there, hold, held up his hand and says, how? And the Indian said, scrambled. <laughs> God forgets your sin. He gets rid of it. We have a song that we, we sung, you know, what sin, what sin. That's an old song, been around forever, but it's so true that, that you know, God, when we ask, when we sincerely ask God to forgive us our sin, he washes us clean and he forgets that sin. And, and we try to bring it up a lot of times. And, 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 and God says, what sin? Uh, you know, that's been taken care of. That's been taken care of. And so our Heavenly Father loves us. He loves us. He's not against us. He is for us. Why in the world, if he's not for us, why would he send his son to die? Die for nothing? No, that's how much he loves us. And, and if nothing else, that ought to be a big, big sign to us of how much Jesus loves us, how much God the Father loves us. Now listen to this in 1 John. If you're there, go to 1 John chapter 4. It's the 1 John back by Revelation. 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. I've already uh, referred to this. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Now, now, I'm going to read some more, but I, I want us to stop right there and think about that line. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. If we stopped right there, that would be enough to live our life in victory. Know God's love and rely upon God's love. But I praise God that John goes on and he explains it a little bit more. God is God is God is by definition God is okay you've got it right whoever lives in love it says lives in God and God in him in this way love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment Judgment shouldn't scare the Christian. We're to have confidence. Why is that? Because our sins have been washed away. Now, what we judge on our works, what does that mean, Brian? That means, what have you done since you got saved? Hello? What have you done with your life that Jesus paid such a high price for? What are you doing with that? 
What, what kind of work are you doing for Jesus? Well, Brian, we're not saved by good works. I'm not talking about salvation here. We're talking about doing something for God. Because our good works turn to, to precious jewels with God. I've said this before, but sometimes we forget. You know, because we're not saved by good works, we think good works don't mean anything. Wrong. They don't save us. But after we're saved, that's what we're going to be judged by. So we better get busy. It doesn't mean God's going to, you know, knock us down or anything, you know, with a good works thing. But, but I want you to know that we are supposed to be doing stuff for God. You know, ministering, sharing his love, doing something um, that lets God know that we appreciate, at the very least, the salvation he's given to us freely. That free gift of salvation. What are we doing to make a difference in our world? What are you doing? What am I doing to make a difference in this world that we live in? This corner of the world, this southeast Missouri that we live in. You know, you're not here by accident. You're born at this time for a reason. You're born in this place and you're living in this place for a reason. And it's to make a difference. Make a difference. And if we're not making a difference, then we're, then we're not completing the assignment. We're not working on the assignment that God has given to us. He's planted us here to make a difference. I keep, it, I keep stopping. We're going to go on. There's another scripture. Verse 18 says, 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love. No fear in love. When you've got true, authentic love going on, there's no fear in that love. But perfect love, which is the agape love of God, drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now I know, and we, we had a little discussion about this in the foundations class at 930, but you know, we, we all wrestle with this. We've got, we've got, we're human, right? We've got these things that we're, we're, that we're still wrestling with, there are some rough edges here and there, some wrestle with it more than others, and there's a lot of factors involved in, in, in how much we deal with this, but we all deal with fear and anxiety to a certain degree. And the question isn't, and the problem really isn't whether we experience it, is what do we do with it? Do you feed that thing or do you starve it? God says starve it. Starve the fear by feeding yourself love. By getting the love of God so planted and so strong in your heart and life that fear and anxiety doesn't have time to take root. As soon as you sense it, you cast it out in Jesus' name. You've got the peace of God. You've got the love that God has given to you. And if you, if you constantly walk in fear, that is, is likely an indication, according to the scripture, that, that you don't have the love of God flowing in your heart and f growing in your heart the way it should. And it's not a condemning statement I'm making. I'm just saying it's just an indication. We all deal with it from time to time, okay? Sometimes we're real confident, no fear, blah, 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 and then something happens beyond our control, and all of a sudden we feel like, oh, my goodness. But perfect love casts out fear. Get back to the perfect love. It's our lifesaver every single time. Perfect love is agape love. Agape. What is, what is agape love? In case you don't know, it's the kind of love whose only source is God. You've got three kinds of love that I'm not going to get into right now. You've got the friendship love. You've got the erotic love, the sexual love. But then you've got the agape love, which is the love of God whose only source is God. And that's what we're talking about here. And then uh, another thing that the, this, uh, this scripture or the Heavenly Father uh, concept of God tells us is that we are completely accepted. We belong. If everybody understood the love of God the way we should, there'd be no gangs. There wouldn't be any gang. There wouldn't be a need for gangs. Because gangs exist because people want to belong. They want to belong. Well, they're, they're violent and they, they get together violent. No, a, 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 the big reason a person joins a gang is because they want to feel like they belong to somebody, to some group, to feel accepted. That's an inbred need that we have. It's not a bad thing to have a need to feel accepted, but it's who do you choose to be a part of? What, what kind of group, what kind of, you know, we got that need for access, acceptance. What are you going to use to fill that need? God accepts us. He accepts us. He accepts us. He loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Isn't that a good thing? He accepts us. 
He does accept us, but he wants us to, to, to experience more of life than we're now experiencing. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. I love Romans 8. I love all the Word of God, but there are some chapters that just seem to jump out at, jump out at you, and, and this one jumps out at me. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. The Spirit, capital S, which is God, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you will live again in fear. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I want to talk about sonship or, in the case of female, daughtership. Okay, Sonship is kind of the generic term for it, but whether you're a man or woman doesn't matter. God wants to adopt us and has adopted us if we've given our lives to Jesus Christ. It means adoption. And you understand, this is a very serious thing. It's, it's a serious thing today. But back when this was written, it was extremely serious to be adopted. It had a process with some serious and some very permanent results. Okay, so listen to this. When you know Jesus, then these kinds of things, these principles are involved in your adoption. First of all, the adopted person lost all rights in the old family. You know who that old family is, right? Okay. Your old, the old family was the sinful family, the family of Satan, I guess you could say. Okay. Now, uh, but we lost all rights when we come to Jesus. We lost all, ri all rights in the old family and gained all, all rights as a legitimate son or daughter in the new family. In other words, we got a new father. We got a new father. Secondly, he or she became heir to the father's estate. Wow. We became heir to the father's estate. Thirdly, according to the law, the old life of the adopted person was completely wiped out. And the, the, one of the most common examples of that is all our old debts were paid. Can you hear the spiritual implications here? The old debts were paid. All the debts were paid. And so we come in brand new. We come in with a clean slate there. He or she was regarded as a new person entering into a brand new existence and the past had nothing to do anymore with him or her. No more past. Completely severed from the past. And then lastly, in the eyes of the law, legally, when it comes to adoption, he or she, we, were legally and absolutely, without a doubt, the son or daughter of our new father. Son, absolutely. There's no question, no doubt. We want to say, well, you know, this is not a foster situation. Or our foster family, Kinnears do the foster thing. And, and uh, you know, just, uh, I know a lot of people in our area do the foster thing. This is not foster, this is adoption. This is adoption, where when you come in and the, the gavel finally comes down on the judge's desk and he says, this is finished the adoption is over, then that is permanently. In fact, in some ways, I've heard this from people who know more about than I do, uh, the intricacies, that they say a lot of times that the, the adoption is a lot more permanent and strong than, 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 than the uh, original uh, birth to the original family. Now, someone knows more about it than me. I just, I just heard that. I've heard, it, I've heard it more than once, too. So I'm, I'm assuming there's some truth to that. And I can believe when it comes to God, that is absolutely the truth. That that is permanent, you know, and you, you just, you don't have to worry about your past. That God gives us a brand new lease on life. He doesn't, and we don't turn over a new leaf. He gives us a new life. You know, forget the leaf thing, you know. Those wither up. But life continues to bring life, you know, a new flow of things into our, into our heart, into our life. So we are completely accepted and, and we belong. Now, I want to talk about Abba Father for a minute. Abba Father. We started out with that. Daddy God, who's your daddy? Who's your Abba Father? Who, who is, you know, and the word Abba is an Aramaic word that would most closely be translated as daddy. 
It was a common term that young children would use to address their fathers. It signifies the close, intimate relationship of a father to his child, as well as the childlike trust that a young child puts in his or her daddy. We said in a said earlier, prayed it, and we talked about it in the foundations class that when the devil starts to attack you or a demonic, you feel a demonic oppression or something, you know, the idea should come to our head that my daddy can beat up your daddy. My daddy's more powerful than anybody or anything. And he provides everything I need. He's going to protect me. He's going to watch over me. He's going to provide. I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry. Right, what if bad things happen? He's going to be with me. He's going to help me through. It's the trust that a child has for a father. When we're small, daddy can make no mistakes. Mama can't make any mistakes. It's that childlike trust. It's that same trust that, that our family had to have but still has after the loss of our daughter. Lord, I don't get it. My brain just, just can't comprehend the reason why. But you know what? That doesn't matter. Because I trust you. I trust you. It's, it's, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. Oh, Brian, you just need to have more insight and all, all this kind of... No, it's that simple. That's the kind of trust that God wants us to have in him. See, we get into trouble, and I'm speaking from personal experience now, when we try to figure it all out. I'm Mr. Analysis, okay? I'm Mr. Analysis. I try to figure everything out. I like studying. I like thinking about things. And, and, and Pam says, you're overthinking it. <laughs> she reminds me of that, and I need to hear that, you know? And Vernon's kind of said that to me a time or two as well. <laughs> you know, take God at his word. Quit thinking about it, because, you know, I can, I, can, I can psych myself out. By thinking about it so much. You know, it's not that God wants us to not be, you know, anal analysis has its place and logic has its place. And I'm not talking about being stupid. Intelligence has its place. But when it's all said and done, how's your trust? When it's all said and done, how's your trust? That's why a young child who is not real intelligent, who, 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 who doesn't know much about anything, can trust God. And trust us. Sometimes that's kind of scary, you know, how much a young child trusts us as parents. And, whew, man, that's, that's a heavy. You know, and sometimes they equate us with God. A young child will equate a parent with God. And if we're living right, that's a good thing. All I'm saying is God wants us to trust him. That's what Abba Father is. With a child-like, an intimate relationship, with a child-like trust. As we say, Daddy... Thank you for loving me. Thank you that I don't have to worry. Fear and anxiety, I don't have to have. Because I know everything's going to be okay. Now, that might sound like irresponsibility to some people. Folks, that's childlike trust. Everything's going to be okay. Because I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I don't care what happens to me. You're going to be with me. And we're going to come out on top. I'm going to make it to heaven. we got a good relationship. End of sentence. End of story. That's what it means to have Daddy God. Folks, we need it nowadays. Well, many people would claim that we are all children of God, I want to tell you this. The Bible reveals quite a different truth. This is important. It enters into this Abba Father, Daddy God thing. We are all his creations. You and I are creations of God. Psalm 139 says we were knit together in our mother's womb before one of our days came to be. God knew us and formed us and shaped us. We're all his creations and under his authority and lordship, and we will be judged by him, as we talked about a minute ago. But being a true child of God and having the right, the right to truly call him Abba Father is something that only born-again Christians are able to do. Because you only become a true child of God when we become a Christian, we repent of our sin and we invite Jesus to come in and we, we have that born again experience like John 10, 9 and 10 talks about, about believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth. 
That's the only way that we truly have God as our Abba Father. God loves being with us. He loves that intimate relationship. And, and, and he, he goes to great extents to establish that relationship with us and keep knocking on our door and keep reminding us of his love and forgiveness and grace. I remember back years ago when we lived in Texas, uh, Brianne, my youngest daughter, was pretty small. And one day, uh, it was just her and me. For, uh, I, can't, I don't remember the, what else was going on that day. It was just her and me. We went to Dairy Queen down in Texas and had lunch. Well, that Dairy Queen had a playground. Okay, so we ate our lunch, and then we decided to go out and play on the playground. And, uh, of course, Brienne had her little tennis shoes on, and she went up the slide backwards. You know, it's supposed to slide down. Well, kids, you know, they're going to go the other way, okay? And I've done that. Well, I decided I was going to do it that day. Well, she had on tennis shoes. I had on shoes. <laughs> you can imagine what happened. I got just part of the way up. My feet went out from under me. I hit the side of that. Uh, slide on my, on my side, and it took the breath out of me. It's the only time in my life I've had the breath taken out of me. And, and I came down, I hit, I slid down, and I'm, I'm at the bottom of the slide like this. I'm trying to get my breath, I'm trying to get my wits about me, and I'm, I'm wondering what just happened, because it happened so quick. And there's Brianne at the top of the slide, saying, you okay, Daddy? I'm fine. It's amazing what a, what a man will say when he's dying, you know. And uh, I, I finally was able to stand up straight eventually, and I said, you go ahead and play, honey. I'll just stand here and watch. <laughs> she did. She played and, you know, had a great time, and I'm trying to recover. And, uh, and uh, come to find out, I think, after talking to somebody else that has had broken ribs, I think I probably cracked a couple ribs that day. And because uh, it took several weeks for me to not be quite so sensitive right there in that area, but I, uh, here's, here's the point of this whole thing. Now, I'm not trying to prove the point of how clumsy I am, but I would have done it all over again to be with my daughter. That was an unforgettable day in two ways, you know, my ribs, but I was with her. And I, I can say this with all my daughters, you know, spending time with them. That's, that's, that's what a daddy does, you know? Spend time with the family. Spend time with the sons and daughters that we have, you know, that God has blessed us with. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I would do it all over again. I really, really would. You've got to trust this father's heart talking about my daughter. And if, if, if we have that kind of a feeling for our earthly children, God is so much more. We can't compare what we feel with him necessarily because God takes has that general feeling, but it's multiplied a zillion, quadrillion times toward us. And so his heart aches when we don't draw close to him. It aches. He's saddened. He may not be mad at us, but I think we make him sad. I really do. When we draw away from him and he says, no, 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 come. Remember I gave my son for you. Come. Oh, no, no, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Oh, my son's death was for no reason. Ouch. See? He's done everything he can. He's waiting on us. Abba, Father. Who's your daddy? seminary professor was vacationing with his wife in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. One morning they were eating breakfast at her little restaurant hoping to enjoy a quiet family meal. While they were waiting for their food, they noticed a distinguished looking white haired man. Excuse me. A distinguished looking white haired man moving from table to table visiting with the guests. The professor leaned over and whispered to his wife, I hope he doesn't come over here. But sure enough, the man did come over to their table. Where are you folks from? He asked in a friendly voice. Oklahoma, they answered. Great to have you here in Tennessee, the stranger said. What do you do for a living? 
I teach in a seminary, he replied. Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach, do you? Well, I've got a really great story for you. And with that, the gentleman pulled up a chair and sat down at the table with the couple. The professor groaned and thought to himself, great. Just what I need, another preacher story. The man started. See that mountain over there, pointing out the restaurant window? Not far from the base of that mountain, there was a boy born to an unwed mother. He had a hard time growing up because every place that he went, he was always asked the same question. Hey, boy, who's your daddy? Whether he was at school, in the grocery store, or drug store, people would ask the same question. Who's your daddy? He would hide at recess and lunchtime from other students. He would avoid going into stores because the question hurt him so bad. When he was about 12 years old, a new preacher came to his church. He would always go in late and slip out early to avoid hearing the question, who's your daddy? But one day, the new preacher said the benediction so fast that he got caught and had to walk out with the crowd. Just about the time he got to the back door, the new preacher, not knowing anything about him, put his hand on his shoulder and asked him, son, who's your daddy? The whole church got deathly quiet. He could feel every eye in the church looking at him. Now everyone would finally know the answer to the question, who's your daddy? This new preacher, though, sensed the situation around him and using discernment that only the Holy Spirit can give, said the following uh, to the scared little boy. Wait a minute. I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You are a child of God. With that, he patted the boy on his shoulder and said, boy, You've got a great inheritance. Go and claim it. With that, the boy smiled for the first time in a long time and walked out the door, a changed person. He was never the same again. Whenever anybody asked him, who's your daddy? He'd just tell him, I'm a child of God. The distinguished gentleman got up from the table and said, isn't that a great story? The professor responded, that is really a great story. As the man turned to leave, he said, you know, if that new preacher hadn't told me that, that I was one of God's children, I probably never would have amounted to anything. And he walked away. A seminary professor and his wife were stunned. He called the waitress over and asked her, you know who that man was? The one who just left that was sitting at our table? The waitress grinned and said, of course. Everybody know, here knows him. That's Ben Hooper. He's governor of Tennessee. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? If God Almighty is not your daddy, by being a child of his, then you can change that today. You're already a precious creation of God. You and I are precious creation. And God gave his son so that we could have him as our Abba Father as our Abba Father, and he wants us to know him like that. Please stand with me. A lot of times we hesitate to give ourselves fully to God because of a feeling of unworthiness, because we feel like we're not going to do it right, or one of a million different reasons. You know what? God says, get rid of all those excuses. Get rid of all those reasons for not coming to me. Come unto me, all you are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He not only gives us rest, he gives us salvation. And that's what it's all about, salvation. What does salvation mean? Salvation not only means we got a place in heaven when we die. I praise God for that. We talked about that earlier. Read scripture, revelation. I'm looking forward to that day. But I praise God, eternal life starts the moment you give your heart to Jesus. Amen. Right here, right now, you can have a daddy-God relationship, an Abba-Father relationship with the God of the universe. You can't put a price on that. So often we overlook the very personal daddy side of God. Is he going to be our judge? Yeah. He's going to judge the unsaved for their sin. He's going to judge the saved according to our works. He's got a wrathful side. But we don't have to experience that wrathful side. 
we don't have to experience that wrathful side because we can have a daddy God childlike trust in our heavenly father every head bowed every eye closed please God's heart aches when we don't draw close to him because that's what the whole deal is about he wants a relationship with his people he wants a relationship with you his creation and he wants you to become a part of his family if you're here today and you have never that you know of have ever said God I repent of my sin forgive me of my sin and I'm turning my life over to you I want to become a member of the family of God once and for all if you've never done that put your hand up and want to pray with you put your hand up if you've never done that so we who know Jesus we've got to understand how precious we are in God's sight that we are his children and that along with being his children comes all kinds of benefits, all kinds of good stuff. We now are a child of the king. And the inheritance that God has for us is indescribable. But some of us don't live according to that relationship. We decide to live according to the world. We decide to live according to the dictates of people around us and conditions around us. And God says, no, 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 no. That's, that's the wrong source. If you're my child, live according to, 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 to my Holy Spirit and my word and, and according to my desires. And I'm with you always. I'm with you always to help you to do all these things. So if you're here today and you want to say, God, I want to live with you consciously every day as my Abba Father. Put your hand up as my Abba Father, that I understand more clearly today than I ever have before how much it means to have you as my Abba Father, my Daddy God who loves me. And as you put your hand up, we're going to let him know that we're going to trust him with everything in us, that we trust him. A childlike trust. It doesn't get complicated. It's not complicated. It's very simple. Let us all pray this together. And I, I do encourage everyone to pray this. You don't have to, but at least those of us who have our hands up. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, thank you I thank you that you have made me your child, you made me your child. because I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and took advantage of your invitation to become a Christian. And Father, I call you Daddy God. You are my Abba Father. And I pray from here on out, you will help me to live as you being my Abba Father. Help me, Lord, to not walk in fear, to not walk in discouragement. Depression is no longer mine because you're my Daddy God. And I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Thank you, God. And I give you praise. In Jesus' name.